Hi everybody, Richard Travers here again at Artificial Lawyer TV. Um, doing a special video interview today to talk about uh, this, Legal Innovators California, which is our landmark US conference, uh, which takes place in San Francisco on June 4th and 5th. Uh, one of our speakers is Megan Ma. Hi, Megan. Hi, Richard. Nice to be here. Um, Megan, uh, we've known for a while at uh, Artificial Lawyer, but it's the first time she's spoken at Legal Innovators. Uh, Megan, could you tell us just a little bit about yourself and the kind of work that you're focused on? Yes, sure. So, hi, everyone. I'm the Associate Director at the Stanford Center for Legal Informatics, or CODEX, as most people know it. Um, my work has been focused on law and linguistics for a while, um, but most recently, obviously, with the advent of a, I guess, infamous technology of generative AI, or specifically ChatGPT, since November 2022, my work has sort of moved into the space of generative AI and the legal space. So everything in that intersection, I've been exploring and trying to understand better. Fantastic. And what better person to speak at Legal Innovators than someone who's very focused on AI? Um, now, I remember in the past, we spoke a lot about machine learning, natural language processing. And now, of course, as you just said, you know, we're moving into this new era of large language models and generative AI. How from, you know, because you've studied effectively the earlier versions of AI and the, the new wave, how big a step change is it from your perspective? Um, I think that at first, this is a great question. And I think part of what I see is the biggest change actually is the point of interaction. So if you look at sort of Dan Katz's work, he's done this incredible paper called Natural Language Processing in the Legal Domain. Um, there he focuses on from an academic perspective, all the research that was in the legal domain from a natural language pro natural language processing perspective was all on kind of these task centric information retrieval, prediction, um, summarization, and actually natural language generation was next to none. And what's fascinating here is actually the chatbot was combined with almost these machine learning, deep learning capabilities, and then it kind of expanded and grew at a magnitude that we had never anticipated, which is the large language model. Um, and the kind of marriage of the two, that's really what got people really excited and fascinated. Because at this point in the past, it was these machines doing work in the background for you. And now you get to interact with it. And this point of interaction, this change and this dialogic change in particular, that I think is the biggest change. Rather than stepwise, that's why it seemed exponential. That's a very good point. And, and it's an interesting one with the earlier forms of machine learning in that a lot of people uh probably didn't realize they're using ai tools uh mm -hmm. in their legal work you know for example uh, someone told me a story uh, about some lawyer who said that he, he refuses to use ai tools uh, and then someone asked him well what tools do you use and he listed them and he said well all, every single one of those is using machine learning right uh, you, you know <laughs> you're just perhaps not interacting with it in a way that displays that that aspect to it so um it's, it's here, it's real, it's becoming uh, adopted in various ways, in various forms across the legal world. For, for you, from what you've seen, what do you think are the most promising use cases? Where do you see the most positive uh, impacts from all of this? Yeah, so some of the, I guess, areas of focus right now at our center um, has actually been in the area of talent management and how do you train for the future lawyer? Um, and it's interesting here because you're the artificial lawyer, but what is it like to kind of build that human machine collaboration? What does it mean to be a partner in 10, 20 years? Those are questions that we are really fascinated by right now. And I think the biggest point about it is in the US, unlike other jurisdictions, there isn't sort of this integrated apprenticeship model that exists. And so in the UK, for example, you have these trainee contracts, you get, you know, young lawyers to sort of dip their toes. In the US, it's sort of this baptism by fire. You kind of write the bar exam and then you're thrown in as a first year associate. And so a lot of law firms already struggle with kind of having young lawyers generate value very quickly. Usually it takes anywhere between three to five years. Um, and so what we're interested in is actually these tools are great at hypotheticals. They're great at dreaming up these situations. And so what we've been working on is this area of simulation. Um, and you're kind of building tools that leverage large language models to kind of give young lawyers a taste of what that experience is like. We know that actually, even if 
a lot of the contracts and legal documents that we're used to seeing, it seems like the knowledge is encased in the four corners, but that's not true. I think most lawyers realize that implicit knowledge, experiential knowledge plays such a major role in the profession. And so a lot of what we've been trying to work on is can we preview some of that? And can we at a lower stakes way kind of work in a pedagogical, maybe even some gamification to kind of allow young lawyers to work through that. So we've, for example, built an M&A negotiation simulator, which we had previewed recently. Um, this is where you can kind of allow young lawyers to understand some of the linguistic cues prior to signing a letter of intent. And so you kind of get all of these like kernels of wisdom and it was built with, you know, lawyers of 40 plus years of experience. You actually know them. They're from Flatiron Law. So we are really excited about that area. I think a lot of what um, is out there in the client facing market is looking at things that are seemingly low hanging fruit like contract analysis, um, legal research, um, all of those areas are all well and good, but I think that they view AI or this generation of AI as just a plugin or a in small integration. Mm -hmm. I think the capabilities of these models are at a level that it should be an AI native or some sort of kind of natural honing of their abilities. And that very much is the case when you think about training. Really interesting. And just and just to reiterate for anyone who's just processing what you've just heard, uh, as far as I understand it, what you're saying is to use generative AI to train the lawyers to be good lawyers. We're not talking about uh, effectively AI products that you're training them to use, you are actually training them to, to be better lawyers in themselves. Yes. That's it. Very interesting. It's, that's, that's, that's a very new take. I haven't heard that one before. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, in terms, just be, before we move on to the next question, just briefly, in terms of the products that you've seen, you know, review, drafting, redlining, uh, research, and so forth, there's a whole bunch of them that are just proliferating. Um, of those, which use cases do you find the most compelling? I think at this stage, what is likely to me most compelling is, I'd say this might be contrarian, but I think actually the most compelling use case is the ability to unpack our own skills as lawyers and determine what is quality legal work versus not. I think at the market right now, if I may be so bold, I think a lot of the skills are sort of these natural kind of, you know, stepwise introductions of generative AI. So as I mentioned, you know, legal research lends itself very well, e-discovery as a tool as well, um, and contract analysis. But none of these things actually tackle the deeper question of if we're using generative AI and if we want to use these tools to work hand in hand with us and actually improve questions of efficiency, actually help us be better lawyers, the first thing we actually really have to tackle is what is quality legal work? And I think that all these tools have the capability of unpacking or allowing us to be a little more introspective. If anything, it's challenging us when we say these tools are not at the level that we want them to perform at. Why is that the case? What is that level? And we frequently get this question from law firms is, oh, I want these tools to be perfect before I can have them in the market. And we sandbox them till their death because we need them to be at a certain level to approach our clients. But what is that level? And consistently, I don't really hear a clear cut answer to that. And so to me, when it comes to a use case, we will find that use case when we can sort of look at ourselves and say that this is a good contract. This is a good piece of like legal brief writing. And I think until we don't have that, our use cases are these kind of entry-level integrations. I think there's so much more potential that has yet to be unpacked. It's just um, they're not cleanly discussed because we simply ourselves don't know what is good quality legal work. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And we, and we saw that in the very first wave. I remember uh, talking to a room full of partners about you know the, the first wave of um, AI doc review tools and then going on about uh, what about accuracy and then me quoting <laughs> to them statistics that I'd read from other papers saying, well, yes, but human lawyers aren't that accurate either. Surprise, right. surprise. And then <laughs> it's kind of like silence, like, well, it just could not process that information because mm -hmm. the natural assumption was, well, we're perfect. 
Mm -hmm. And so there was this kind of like, before they could really see the benefits of AI, they had to try and understand what they did themselves. Mm -hmm. And another observation there, I guess, is that one of the interesting things about all technology is that it enables us to be more objective about what we do ourselves. So if you say this, this product will, I don't know, help you to review, you start thinking, well, actually, how do I review things? Right. Why do I review them like that? Right. Right. And even the dimension of accuracy is really interesting. Like from a sort of technological perspective, we view accuracy as like, yes, this is right. Or like, no, it's not. But actually for lawyers, accuracy is kind of has an added depth such that when you say accurate, it's I took kind of these sets of facts and I synthesized it in a way that makes sense in a nice comprehensive argument. And so it's actually a little more than just like yes or no. It's like yes. And it's also very convincing and persuasive. And like that kind of additional subjective element to accuracy is what also makes evaluation of these tools very difficult at this stage. Yeah, no, it. and that's it. It connects to this idea of why are contracts so long or why are there so many things? Right. Because, you know, should I do this? Yes. Is that an accurate answer? Well, yes, but, and then here are all the caveats. Right. The caveats are 500 pages. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, no, that is, that's very fascinating. And it's, uh, well, that, we'll have plenty to talk about uh, during the event, which will be uh, in San Francisco, June 4th and 5th, Legal Innovators, California. Tickets are on sale now. Uh, next question is what are the challenges? I mean, everyone's heard about uh, lawyers using ChatGPT as if it was Westlaw and then being shocked to realize <laughs> when they realized it actually wasn't a, a bona fide uh, source. Um, Aside from, you might say, the sort of crazy errors, what are the main challenges that you see uh, with adopting this technology? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges to me is pretty structural. I think it's the fact that um, there's suddenly a widespread interest that is almost like a renaissance into legal tech. I think, you know, 10 years ago, if you were to ask, you know, folks that were in legal, you know, all of them are deeply steeped into like the legal practice. They, their commitment was because they felt that there was like fundamental inefficiencies there. Um, and now you see actually all these technologists kind of throw themselves in because in their mind, legal is just very text driven. And so what better than to use a language model for something that's very language based. And what these founders are sort of quickly realizing is that there's all these incumbents, such as, you know, Westlaw, LexisNexis, that have such a strong foothold and relationships that have been cultivated for years and years and years. And I think that that's going to be the biggest challenge, right? For incumbents, it's, you know, the ability to move faster and more agile, like the way that startups do and the way that they can think creatively about these tools. But I think for founders, it's being able to identify, you know, how do we actually build those relationships? What are the sunk costs that these existing incumbents have already made that, you know, you simply cannot keep up with? So legal, so much of the data is proprietary, unfortunately. And even even the data that is widely available, it's not necessarily quality data. And we think about this a lot in academia, right? Like some of the some of the biggest open data sets in contracts or even case law, like we feel like they're not as great as obviously the types of data that, you know, Thomson Reuters and LexisNexis will have. And I think that that is going to be a game changer, first of all. Um, and the second is, is what kind of these law firms are seeing, they never will necessarily reveal unless you work closely with them in the co-creation of building these products. And so being able to master these relationships and being able to kind of unpack again that implicit experiential knowledge, that's really going to be what's going to be highly impactful in the industry. Other than that, just sort of tackling, you know, these contracts or like legal documents, those are finished products that's gone through the negotiation, that's gone through all the strategy and thinking and the process. Like legal is very process oriented. It's not product oriented. And so right now we've only focused on the latter and that's going to kind of still keep us in the very early days. I think until we start entering maturity, that's where we're going to look at some of the other aspects. And that's kind of, I think the biggest challenge. 
fascinating fascinating and i i like the the the, uh, the use of the term renaissance because it does feel like that i mean as you know i've been away on a sabbatical and uh the enthusiasm for legal technology has gone through the roof again which is <laughs> which is great to see which is great to see um very last thing um yeah, we're obviously very excited to have you speak um for you personally um why are you excited to uh, be a speaker at legal innovators california i'm really excited because i think it's such an incredible crowd it's like a nice mix of academia and industry and some technologists and as a personal anecdote i actually one of our greatest collaborations that are all co consistently ongoing actually right now is with Flatiron law and it's with partners lenny and conrad um and i met them there two years ago mm -hmm. and it is because of legal innovators that you know i've got to have these great conversations and people that you invite as speakers they are the ones that are driving and pushing the needle in this space. So yeah, I'm very excited to be a part of it this year and yeah, looking forward to speaking with everyone there. Fantastic. Thanks, Megan. And uh, yeah, and as mentioned, we're very excited as well to be hosting the event, which is in San Francisco, June 4th and 5th. Tickets are available. Uh, the website is uh, www.legalinnovatorscalifornia.com and uh, or if you'd like more information, just go to the Artificial Lawyer website and you can find links there. But uh, enough from me. And just to say, thank you very much to Megan. Thank you. Thanks.